Thank you. So, um, as has been said, the organization I work for, C40, is a network of cities. It's a network of some of the, the biggest, the greatest cities uh, in the world. Now, despite its name, 91 uh, member cities, and indeed, uh, the elected leader of C40 is, is Anne Hidalgo, the mayor, mayor of Paris. Uh, so I'm fortunate enough to spend a lot of time here in this wonderful city uh, since she became the leader a few months ago. And what we're focused on as an organization is bringing together the leaders of those incredible 90 cities, which stretch from New York to Beijing, Tokyo, Shanghai, London, Paris, Jakarta, all around the world, um, so that the mayors inspire each other to be more ambitious uh, in making their cities the low-carbon cities of the future that we need to see if we're going to tackle climate change. But if this is working, I have some slides. I'm pressing the big green button. Is that the right one? Ah, oh, we've, we've got a long way through. Let's go back a bit. There we go. So, um, so what I'm supposed to talk about is uh, how mayors are changing uh, the world order. Uh, and, and really that's a, a kind of a, a sense that we're in a, a, a tipping point now in, the way in, in global governance in the world, moving out of the era where global governance is dominated by powerful nation states and perhaps into one or maybe back to one where it's, it's progressive city leaders working together that instead set the direction uh, of, of humanity um, as a whole. And one of the reasons for making that, that assertion is the way that city leaders are starting to work together, have been working together over the last decade on one major global issue, uh, climate change. But first, if I can... Just, just to kind of set the scene, I think now it's pre we, we all know the statistics, half of humanity and rising uh, live in cities. 1.4 million people work moving to towns and cities uh, every day. And where people want to live, business wants to invest, and so the rise of the city uh, is, is now, I think, inexorable. It's, it's unstoppable. Uh, and so just, just that simple fact of how many people now live in urban areas is driving cities to be organs of change in society. But this is not, this is not necessarily something new. We think about it as a kind of a, a very 21st century phenomenon, but if you, you look back into the past, many of the pivotal moments in human development have occurred in and because people are living in cities. Athens and the birth of democracy, Rome and those incredible scientific engineering and indeed political uh, developments, Florence and the great Italian cities in the Renaissance period, the Enlightenment uh, in Paris and elsewhere, the Industrial Revolution uh, in Manchester, near where I grew up, uh, in London, Birmingham, all, of the, all, all has, has germinated uh, those huge epoch epoch epochal changes have germinated uh, and cities have happened because of people, in innovative people living in close proximity to each other in cities. But then we've had this kind of slightly strange period in the, the rest of human history for the last 150 years where the nation st state has taken over and we've, we've defined the way that the world works by the relationship mostly conflictual between um, those nation states. And I think what we're, we're simply doing now is, is recalibrating back to a more successful model uh, of governments in the way that cities are now rising again. And one of the first indicators, but also one of the reasons why city leaders, mayors are coming to prominence, has been their ability to work together on tackling climate change. It's, if it's now 20, almost 30 years of uh, nation states since the, the Kyoto Protocol was first brought into being, trying to come together to solve a problem that they all recognize, with the, now the exception of the leader of the United States, as being an existential crisis for the world. And yet, since 1990, global carbon emissions have increased by over 60% rather than, than going down. And although we finally got an agreement between the nation states, that we need to tackle climate change in Paris at the end of 2015. That agreement was very limited in the sense that it set out the correct aspiration, but it didn't set out the mechanism by which that aspiration could be achieved. 
Meanwhile, in the background, you've had city leaders quietly organising themselves to take on the leadership of tackling climate change through their own uh, through their own powers and through their own collaboration. And it's happened in in, a, in thousands of rather small ways. One of the, the reason this image is on the screen, this is uh, from uh, Beijing, where I was um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it's an image that's now replicated all around that city, just hundreds and hundreds of bikes. You, here they're not being used, but I can assure you, thousands of people are cycling all across Beijing. And it's really it's a story of, uh, of city collaboration. I visited uh, Beijing back in 2006 uh, as a transport advisor then to the mayor of London, met with my counterpart uh, in Beijing, and was rather horrified when he showed me his plan to get rid of cycling in Beijing as a sign of the progress of the city, and they thought they were modelling themselves on the success of American and European cities. They were trying to use polity to push people off bikes and on into cars, and indeed in, into public transport. But they saw the rise of the car as a symbol of Beijing's success. Meanwhile, and as I was trying to say to my, to my colleague there, in London, we were desperately trying to get people onto bikes and out of their cars, as were many other mayors all, all across Europe and the rest of the world. And one of the very successful ways that that's been achieved has been through the cycle hire schemes that originated uh, in Barcelona, Lyon, and, and indeed in Paris, where it, it came to, to great prominence. And I remember sitting at, at a meeting with my, my mayor, the mayor of London, when the then mayor of Paris, uh, Mayor Delanoy, introduced the, the Veleb cycle hire scheme, and my mayor simply jabbed me in the ribs and said, why didn't you think of that? But what, what happened very quickly was we copied it, 45 of the cities within a year and a half across the C40 had copied that idea, and now cycle hire has spread all around the world. One of the places it didn't go to was, in any big way, um, was China. And indeed, the last time I was in China a year ago, there were always almost nobody cycling on the streets. Just eight months later, there are 100,000 cycle hire bikes in Beijing. There are 300,000 cycle hire bikes in Shanghai, all privately owned, supported um, by the municipal authorities, but four cycle hire schemes have been uh, allowed to completely flood the streets with bikes. And in response, the city authorities have created cycle lanes, segregated cycle lanes right across the city that suddenly means Beijing is a cycling city again. You can't go down a major street without seeing hundreds and hundreds of people cycling. And I think what we'll see now is a, com is a complete loop with that model that's now working so successfully in Beijing, incredibly cheap. You don't need to sign up to anything. You just need to use your equivalent of a Twitter account, their Weibo, to access the bike. I think you're going to see a lovely loop now where the Chinese cycle hire schemes are the ones that change the way that we mobility in Europe and North America. And indeed, with that scale of bikes, you really can see the possibility of it being a major form uh, of transport. So that's just one example of, of how um, cities have been sharing successfully. Another would be the way that um, the city of Berlin, when it got in some financial difficulty, tried to, to balance its budget by reducing its energy costs, retrofitting all of its public buildings, but created a new way, energy performance contracting, way of doing that where the private sector put up the investment for the retrofitting of the buildings, and the city paid them effectively out of the energy savings in those buildings. Now we see that spread across about 30 cities in C40. Or we hear locked governments talking about the need for carbon pricing, but it, it hasn't come into effect in any great way at a national or an international scale, but it's absolutely happening at a city scale. There, Tokyo starting a cap-and-trades scheme uh, for its buildings initially, now copied by six or seven Chinese cities. I could, I could keep going on. So there are hundreds and hundreds of examples how cities are, are copying from one another and therefore massively scaling up their action uh, tackling climate change, which means now that the, the mayors in in the C40 cities and other, and other networks, have got climate change right at the top of their political agenda, whereas for national leaders, it often doesn't figure at all uh, in their manifestos. And indeed, the biggest uh, example of that, of course, is in the United States uh, in recent months. President Trump pulling out of the, the Paris Climate uh, Agreement, and the response to that has not been uh, that for other countries to follow suit, but absolutely not for America to feel that it's not still committed to tackling climate change. Instead, now 350 mayors, Democrat and Republican, standing up and saying, we're still in, we're still committed to the Paris Agreement, working with business, 
working with the governors of one or two uh, states to say that they're going to deliver America's pledge as part of the Paris Agreement, with or without the federal government. And I think this is a, a huge political shift now that very formally those sub-national leaders are taking responsibility for the commitments of the country as a whole. And it's been interesting that rather than having a depressing effect, pr the president coming out, denying the science of climate change, pulling the government out of action, international uh, agreement, instead it's been a massive galvanizing effect in the States. Our American mayors have never been so active, and actually what they found is it started to get popular support for climate action in a way that didn't exist before. People needed something uh, to push against uh, to get them to that stage, perhaps. And so, let me jump on and I'll come back. One of the things, therefore, that we've done in C40 now is to model what it would take for the member cities of C40 to deliver climate action that's consistent with the Paris Agreement, so constraining global temperature rise to a maximum of 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial average. Work out that what, me, that what that means year by year, ton by ton, dollar by dollar, and then gain a commitment from all of those member cities that they will now put in place the action program in their cities that's consistent with meeting that objective. So that you can actually say the first constituency of political leaders that's actually committed to tackle climate change, that not just has the aspiration, but is committing to the action as well, are the mayors of the world's great cities. And it's a, a program called Deadline 2020 that you can see uh, on that slide. And so if you extrapolate a little bit of from that, this, this coming together, this very collaborative uh, way of working between cities on tackling climate change, it's not such a, a great leap to see what the uh, American political philosopher who sadly died a couple of months ago, uh, Benjamin Barber, talked about as mayors ruling the world. But he, even perhaps United Cities re replacing uh, the United Nations. Because mayors are now getting organised in quite a formal way, but a very different way to that which nation-states have chosen to organize themselves. So if you think of the, the construct of, of the nation-state from the, the post-enlightenment period, uh, in the Western world at least, the primary function of the nation-state is first to defend its borders, to have an army, and then to defend uh, its own economy, and therefore tariffs, protectionism of, of some order, even in the free, free trade world, that's always what, what governments have ultimately fallen back on. It makes it very difficult for the presidents and prime ministers to come together and collaborate over global issues, because mostly when they, when they, they come together, they end up falling out, they end up falling back into a confrontational manner. What we're seeing with mayors is something rather different. This image is, actually, is from the, uh, the library at, at City Hall here in Paris uh, from a year and a half ago. It's the meeting of the C40 Steering Committee. Uh, 14 mayors elected by their peers to lead the C40 organisation. So there is, there is a leadership. There's a council that comes together to set the overall direction. But actually, the model, there's, there are... There are very few uh, declarations or statements or rules that, that the mayors all have to collectively agree. Instead, the C40 is, a, is an opt-in model. So the 40 mayors that want to work on renewable energy all agree to go off and work on renewable energy together. The 25 that want to work on bus rapid transit form a little network within C40 and work together. And so that works across 20 or 30 issues. So they find uh, the biggest common denominator and work together and push and inspire each other, but they don't make difference a barrier to collaborating. You don't all have to agree on the whole agenda in order uh, to be part of uh, the network. And indeed, that's allowed us then, as an organization, uh, to create some very general participation standards that they all agree have to be met and, the, and to make the organization an invite-only club. You're not a member of C40 as of right, just because you're a big city, but only if the other mayors feel that you're showing real leadership in the world and want uh, to invite you in. So a rather different model uh, of how to work collaboratively. And whilst the basis of, of C40, the starting point, uh, has been to collaborate together solely on climate change, now we see the conversation shifting slightly. Uh, in the first instance, in starting to think about how policies to tackle climate change can also build a more equitable society, 
Uh, indeed, I'm not a religious person myself, but, but very much in part inspired by the Pope and his encyclical of a, a couple of years ago, which really made an incredibly strong argument that it's not possible to tackle poverty and inequality without tackling climate change, because it's the poorest nations of the world that are getting hit first and hit hardest by climate change. But equally, it's not possible to tackle climate change in an unequal society. Uh, and actually, this is one of the reasons I think that the, the political right, particularly in the United States, have been so opposed to climate action, because the kind of things that you do to tackle climate change do tend towards a more sharing, a more collaborative, a more public sector-led uh, uh, approach uh, of governance. So public space, public transport, public uh, energy, planning the development of cities rather than leaving it purely uh, to market forces. But also because, and I think this is probably the most critical thing, and, and particularly why I was interested to be at this event uh, today, actually it's impossible for any political leader, however dynamic, however progressive they are, to really deliver on climate change if they aren't le having leadership from the bottom up and working with their citizens. And it's very hard to persuade individual citizens to make changes in their own life to tackle climate change if they feel they're living in a very unequal society where the, the richest people at the top are grabbing most of the resources, don't seem to care at all about uh, how much energy they're expending, how much they're contributing to climate change, uh, and why should, why should I make a change in my life if the people who grab most of the resources aren't, aren't prepared to do anything themselves. And so we're seeing within the C40 the conversation starting to move on, on tackling inequality, but also picking up other big global issues where city leaders tend to have a more progressive view on, on aggregate than nation states. And so the whole issue of, of immigration and, and migration, the great cities of the world thrive on attracting the best people from all around the world and having those incredible cosmopolitan melting pots that make Paris, London, New York such exciting places to live. But that's threatened by the, the wave of xenophobia that we see at a national level. So we see... Um, mayors and city networks now starting to broaden their scope. They've shown that they can collaborate together in a way that's eluded uh, national leaders. They've found a method of working together. They've shown they can really deliver results uh, on, on one issue. But I think the, the real big challenge here is now that next step of, of, of how organizations like mine and the mayors that we represent are really able uh, to work and, and engage with their citizens. And you've heard some examples, and I'm sure we're going to hear lots over, over the next uh, few hours um, of how that is happening. But I think we go back to a, a very kind of simple premise here, that, that sharing is the way, for, is the way forward in its, in its widest sense. Collaboration is the thing that has made, that has made the human species come out uh, as the dominant species, for good or bad, in the world. We, we, it's not because we were the, the strongest animal, it's not because we were the fastest, it's because we used our brain power to work together uh, to overcome obstacles that otherwise that any individual other animal uh, would have defeated us. And that, that kind of got lost again in that kind of late 19th century period when we tended to focus on the survival of the fittest, on the, the spur of in competition between individuals. But big challenges like climate change now, I think, are pushing us back into the need to collaborate. And the rise of the digital society, the rise of, of social media, is making that much more possible. And one is really seeing the, the kind of bottom-up push of collaboration. And I'll, I'll finish on, on just one example. Uh, our former uh, chair, the former leader of C40, was the, the mayor of Rio. And a, a few years ago, Eduardo Paez, a few years ago, uh, he was suddenly faced with hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in Rio protesting at rising bus fares. Actually, not his fault, they were imposed by the national government, but protesting at rising bus fares. And this seemed to have come from nowhere. They couldn't identify any organisations that they'd previously heard of that had been able to mobilise these hundreds of thousands of people on the streets, and there weren't any identifiable leaders of the process. And he, he just said to his officials, go out and find me the people who organise this thing I, and get them in to meet me. And it turned out it had been organised basically by a bunch of teenagers uh, on Facebook. And he brought them in. They thought they were coming in for some massive dressing, dressing down by the mayor. And instead they walked into his office and he offered them all a job. And 
he hired 20 of them on the spot and created something called Labrio. And he said, I have no idea how you organize those people. I, know, I don't understand Facebook. I don't understand social media. But I want you to use it for the positive good of, of Rio, to engage people and, and help me to give them, give them better. Gave them a budget and put them in, in an office very close to one of his closest advisors and let them kind of reign free. I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to see uh, a lot more of in the future. We'd never have, have had it in the past. We're unlikely to get it from presidents and prime ministers, but we're absolutely seeing it from mayors. Thank you very much.